welcome back to the Talks of Life podcast. Today, I have an amazing guest. His name is David Stone. He is the creator of I Fearless, and that is a wonderful website that you can go to and learn a little bit more about his work. He is an author, life coach, transformational speaker, and leader that is dedicated to helping people overcome their anxieties, worries, and self-doubts that keep us from achieving our highest potential. Welcome to the show, David. I'm very thankful to have you here. Thank you, Brittany. I'm thrilled to be here. As we are all, I uh, think, globally facing a lot of worries, anxiety, you know, it all encompasses um, a lot of just unnatural way of living. And I think you have a lot of wisdom and truth to share with the world. And I am honored to have you as a guest on this podcast. So, Well, thank you very much. And you're absolutely right. In this day and age, there's an awful lot of problems that we're facing. There are challenges that we're facing. But I would uh, make a very, um, maybe even controversial statement. And I would say there is nothing out there for us to worry about. And uh, because worrying and problem solving are two very, very different things. And worrying uh, solves nothing. It doesn't make coronavirus go away. It doesn't remove partisan politics. It doesn't make hurricanes stop. Worrying accomplishes nothing. The only thing it does is makes us feel awful and makes us sick. <laughs> Those two things, and, and if that, uh, if you want that in your life, then God bless you. Go ahead and worry. But otherwise, let's take a different, uh, let's take a different approach. And the thing about it is, you know, everybody said, "What do you mean? There's nothing to worry about. There's all these problems, you know, all these things that we have to worry about." And to that, I would say that yes, most people, and it's very normal to have a worried and an anxious response to that, but. That is a mental choice that we make. We are not required. We're not biologically wired up to worry about things. And we, we've made that mental choice to worry about it. But the thing is, we've been making that mental choice for so long, it's simply become a habit and that, we're com that we're unaware of. And like any habit, it's completely below the level of consciousness and so we think it's normal. We think it's, we have no choice about it, but we do. We have a huge choice in that and we don't have to worry. Yeah, I really need to uh, be clear. And that is, I do also recognize that there is in, for some people, genuine mental illness. And that really needs to be said. Um, and that's a very different situation than just the rest of us folks who just worry too much and don't you know, say, don't decide to take control of our mind. And in the cases of genuine mental illness, I'm really, really grateful that there are the medications, there are the healthcare professionals who can help with that. But for the rest of us, we don't need that. We don't need to be popping pills. Oh, oh I'm worried. Doc, give me, give me a Xanax or give me a Prozac or something. No, you don't need that. That's just the lazy way out. Come on grab it and take control for yourself. Growing up maybe in a day and age where there wasn't as much pollution, you know, the noise, if you will, of mm -hmm. marketing, advertisements, social media, every news outlet you could imagine, just always trying to steal your attention or again, make you worry or fearful um, of, of things of that nature. Um, can you take us back to maybe when you were a child or um, young adult when you were experiencing some anxiety or worries and where that brought you to?
the big thing, the difference is how we choose to respond, how we choose to react to the challenges that are put in front of us. And that choice is something that no matter what the era is, no matter what age it is, no matter whether we're young and old, whether we were born in the, you know, in the 40s, in the 60s, in the 80s, in the, you know, even just now in the last 20 years, we all have the same ability to choose our response to that. And a, a worried or an anxious response is not a useful response. One of the things I always like to say is, is does this serve me? Is this serving me to, for me to be responding this way, for me to be worried? Does that help the situation? Does it make me feel better? Does it solve the problem? And in every single situation, worrying about something does not solve the problem. And so, you know, I grew up, um, I grew up in the 50s and 60s. And uh, as a young boy, I was, uh, I grew up in a family that uh, did not have a lot of money. We had a lot of kids, but not a lot of money. And so I remember as a child growing up, uh, watching my parents once a month, they'd sit around the kitchen table with this stack of bills that to be paid. And they'd have this terrible worried look on their face and they'd say, oh, I don't know how we're going to make this. We don't know how we're going to do that. And we're going to have to steal some from here to pay there. And so I grew up with this idea. I was kind of trained, not that they sat me down and trained me, but we, we absorbed these lessons. Uh, I grew up believing that the only people that can possibly be wealthy or prosperous are either lucky or crooked. And, uh, but normal folks, no, no, you don't stand a chance. And of course, that's false. That's completely false. But it informed a great deal of my adult life. And I spent my, you know, 55 years thinking, oh, boy, this is hard. This is hard. It's constant struggle. And uh, it was only in my you know, later adulthood that I suddenly thought, well, this isn't working. This doesn't, it's not serving me well. And then I said, why, why, am, why, how is this helping me worrying about it? And it's not. And then I started to read and learn and study other people. And I realized, well, that underlying belief that I have is just wrong. It, it's a false belief. And yet it's been informing my life all this time. And so I decided I'm going to choose to have a different belief, one that serves me better. And we all have various things that we grow up with, uh, that we were trained. It's interesting, none of us, uh, none of us were born worrying. We were, as, as infants, we're born with two and only two fears. Number one is the fear of loud noises, and number two is the fear of falling. Those two are kind of built into us. Everything else we have learned or been conditioned to or been taught. Uh, I mean, imagine, think about when you're, when you're a little kid and you're growing up and it's, you know, you're starting to be able to move around the world and, you know, you're in, the, I don't know, fourth grade and you're walking home from school alone while your mother has drilled into you, your parents, whoever looked after you, you know, stranger danger, don't talk to strangers, be careful, you know, there's so many things to be afraid of out there. And when you're six years old walking home from school by yourself, um, you know, don't talk to strangers is really good advice. The problem though, is that it tends to last. And when you're 26 or 46 or 76, and you're still afraid of talking to people that you don't know, that's gotten out of hand and it doesn't serve you at all. And yet we carry these things forward with us. Um, and whether it's money, whether it's strangers, whether we've uh, been taught to worry about our health, whether we've been taught to worry about relationships, I mean, the topics are all over the place, or hurricanes, or politics, or whatever it is. Uh, we've, you know, we've been taught and we carry these things around with us, and it makes us feel awful, and it doesn't solve the problem. There are four major problems uh, with worry and anxiety as a, as a mental choice. The first one is it just feels awful. It sucks <laughs> to worry because that's one of the worst um, emotions that we feel as humans. It just, it just really, really ruins your day. The second thing is it never solves a problem. 
where our thinking goes around and around and around and around, but it never makes any progress. As I said a few minutes ago, problem solving is something that's very, very different kind of activity from worry. When you're problem solving, you, uh, you, know, you assess the situation. Okay, there is a challenge. There is a problem to be solved that's, that's causing us trouble. Uh, I assess what the problem is. I weigh different options. I look at, uh, you know, cost-benefit analysis, even if it's a personal problem. I try a solution. If it gets me the results I want, then I keep doing that. If it doesn't, I try a different uh, solution. But the point is, I'm I'm taking action and I'm moving forward, getting results. Worry, though, just going around and around in circles. And tomorrow morning and next week, I'm still having the same thoughts as I did yesterday and last week, and, and it doesn't serve me. The third thing that's a problem with it is it makes us sick, literally makes you sick. And the long list of uh, ailments that can result from chronic worrying and chronic anxiety is, is enormous and, and frankly scary. Um, there's what happens, the way, the way it works is that our bodies are designed uh, to respond to a fearful situation. So, you know, and this goes back millions of years as we evolved. But if you're wandering along through the savanna and suddenly there's a, a, a lion coming, jumping out of the bushes to eat you, or today if you're walking along the street and you step out in the street and you look and there's a bus coming at you, our bodies are biologically designed to respond to what we perceive as a threat oh dear, you know, this is going to hurt me and this is not going to end well. And what happens is you instantly start, uh, you, first of all, adrenaline pumps into your body. Cortisol, uh, it's also known as the stress hormone, pumps into your bloodstream. Your heart rate goes up, your breathing rate goes up, and your body is primed to take action. Mm -hmm. Suddenly you're stronger than you were before. You're more capable. You have faster, your quicker reactions. And you either run away from the lion or jump back on the sidewalk and avoid the bus. But then the emergency is over. And so the bus goes by, you're safe, your breathing goes back down, the stuff flushes out of your system and you're back to normal. But in a, in a situation where the threat or the perceived threat is more vague or far off in the distance, so, you know, there's a prediction that a hurricane might come here, or I'm concerned about my uh, re save retirement savings. Am I going to have enough? Or, or, or what's this mole on my arm that wasn't there before? So these are things that are more vague, and yet our brain is responding to them as threats. So our body, it can't tell the difference between something I'm imagining and something that's real. Our body primes itself for an emergency, just like it did before, but there's nothing to do. And so we just keep having these elevated stress levels and your body keeps pumping cortisol into your system. And it, that after a while, it becomes toxic. It, you know, cortisol is like the fire department. It's really handy to have it around, but it, the, the really good days are when you don't need it. <laughs> Those are the best days when you don't need to respond to an emergency. But when there is an emergency and an emergency is defined as a, something that happens in a, you know, it's a short-term situation and then it's gone, then it's really handy to have it along. Uh, but we don't want it around forever because it literally can make you sick. There's heart disease, there's elevated blood pressure, there's uh, diabetes, there's actually, there's reduced sex drive. It comes to a result of chronic anxiety. So that's the third thing. And the fourth thing that's the, the problem with chronic anxiety is it stifles our potential because we stop ourselves before we even try something. You know, even something like a, a very small thing, like, uh, oh, let's go out to a bar tonight and we'll do karaoke. Oh, you know, I'm afraid of what people might think of me. I'm too shy to do that. And, and so, you know, who knows? You might have had a, uh, um, a career as a, as a pop star, but you don't even try it. On a bigger issue, um, you know, I'd really love to go back and get that other degree from university and really, you know, let my career take off. Oh, but I think I'm too old. Or what would people say? Uh, I'm worried about, you know, how hard it might be. 
well, there you go, you're done. <laughs> you know, I'm too old to do that. Well, then we've set up our own roadblocks before we even try. That's the problem with worry and anxiety choice that we make. I know that there's going to be a lot of your listeners who will say, no, it's not a choice. I, you know, I'd rather not worry, but I, I, don't, I can't help it. It's just who I am. I, I, my mother worried, my sisters worry, my brothers worry, everybody around me worries, the whole world worries. I can't help it. Um, well, I know that it feels like that, but that's as a result of this worry having become a habit. And a habit, as I said, is, uh, exists, it's mental activity that's below the level of our consciousness. So we're not even aware that this is going on. Now, some habits are really, really useful and really handy. Uh, you, you come home from work at the end of the day, you walk in the door, you toss your car keys into the bulb on the table by the, uh, uh, by the front door. Now, the good thing about a habit like that is you solve this, the problem of where should I put my car keys once? And now you, just, you don't have to solve it every day when you get home from work. It's, there's the, and, and it reaches a point where you're not even thinking about it. So, you know, 20 minutes later, if you think, where are my car keys? And you think, I know where they are. They're right there. I don't even remember dropping them you know, on the table, but there they are. And so we don't have to go and re-solve the same problem over and over again. So that's really handy. Negative habits, though become just as unconscious, just as uh, um, ongoing, but they don't serve us. In fact, they, they harm us. I mean, we can look at um, habits of uh, substance abuse. We can look at habits of um, physical abuse of our, either ourselves or other people or anything that these are habits and we say, I can't help it. Well, we can, but we, the, the, what we need to do is raise the habit into our level of awareness and consciousness. That's the first step so that we can say, oh yeah, there I am, I'm worrying again. Or there I am having this response, this anxious response. So that's where we start, just by raising our awareness and saying, okay, now I'm catching myself worrying. And when we start catching ourselves, then we can say, Hmm, who, would it serve me better to have a different response? And we can start practicing. Um, at first, it feels really weird, as it does with any habit. Here's a fun little exercise that your, your listeners can do. You know, we fold your hands, just for fun. Go ahead, fold your hands like that. Now, take a look, and which of your thumbs is on top? It's uh, my, my left one. Your left one. For me, my right thumb is on top, okay? <laughs> Now, that's just, you know, I don't even think about it. Now, undo your hands and redo them the other way with your right one on top. Feels weird, huh? It does. It feels uncomfortable. And yet, there, physiologically, there is nothing about your hands that says this is the correct way and this is the wrong way. It's just that we've gotten into that habit. And so if you were, you know, if you could even think it was useful or, or valuable, you could spend the next two weeks and you know, three or four times a day, cross your fingers and consciously do it that way. And within a couple of weeks, you, that would feel normal and this would feel weird. That's how you replace a habit. You have to replace it. A habit just won't go away on its own. You have to replace it with something else. And so it's the mental habit is the same thing. So I'm going to start replacing the mental habit, this worry habit, with something else. But step one, I have to catch myself. So I'll spend a little time. I'll journal a little bit. I'll take some notes. And as I catch myself worrying, how often, what are your worry topics? How often do you worry about it? How would you measure the level of worry, you know, a one to ten kind of scale? And, and just jot these down so we become more and more aware of how this worrying thing works. And then once we've done that, oh, oh, and the other thing is what are your worry topics? You know, what are your go-to uh, worry things? Uh, everybody has their own, everybody's a little bit different. Um, but now I've documented them and now I say, okay, I would like to change this. And the very next thing we have to do 
as we decide we want to change that and stop worrying is to make the decision to take 100% responsibility for everything that happens to us. And that's the, that's the key to this whole thing. That is, it's like a switch that you're going to flip. Because as long as I am uh, worrying and I'm, let, let's find some things to blame, all right? I'm going to blame the weather. We've got a hurricane. Let's blame global warming for that. Let's blame uh, just the season. It's November and the hurricanes are still coming. So there, that's what we're going to blame. Let's blame partisan politics. Here we're in the we're still counting votes for from the election. And that's who the problem is. It's not my, you know, it's their problem. Uh, it's my mother's problem. She brought me up wrong. It's the teacher's problem. They didn't teach me well, whatever it is. So we, there's no end of people or circumstances that we could find to point to and say, if only it wasn't for them, my life would be great. The problem with that though, is until the weather, the government, your mother, you know, all these people say, oh gosh, I'm so sorry, Brittany, I didn't realize I was messing up your life that way, I'll change. Until they make that decision, you're stuck because we got, I can't change a thing as long as it's up to somebody else. But as soon as I make the decision that, no, no, I'm gonna take responsibility for it, then I've got all the power to change it. And that's wonderful. Even in something like a hurricane, you know, you didn't cause it and you can, you know, you can say it might be global warming, whatever it is, but the point is this hurricane's coming. What are you gonna do about it? All right, there's a problem to be solved. Uh, you know, if I really, really, really don't like hurricanes, what are you doing living in a hurricane zone? <laughs> so, you know, move to, uh, you know, Manitoba. They don't have hurricanes in Manitoba. They, uh, they have, you know, ridiculous blizzards and things, but no hurricanes. So the, that's how we start taking responsibility. Or we could say, no, I really, really like living here. So I will just learn to live with it. And I'll either dig in myself an underground bunker or I'll take the normal precautions, whatever it is. And then we can stop worrying about it. And you have taken control again. That's the most wonderful thing is in, now instead of the worry and the anxiety owning and controlling you, you own and control them. And you say, no, I'm not gonna worry about that because I don't like the way it feels and I don't like the way it accomplishes nothing at all. So that's how we can start taking control of it. And then what we do is we, dis, we, we start journaling and, and that's a really important, part of it. And I always, I, I keep a journal handy. I, I even have this special pen that I use, a lovely gift from my wife that I write with uh, in, the, in my journal. And I will, you know, as I discover new things that are going on in my, inside my head, I'm going to write them down because what that does is, you know, all these thoughts that are swirling around my head, I take them out of my head and put them down onto the paper. And, there, and it's really important, I, I find at least, to write with a pen or a pencil onto paper, as opposed to uh, typing on your, your keyboard or dictating into your voice memo, whatever it is. And there's this kinesthetic act of writing that, um, first of all, it distracts you from thinking about the thing you're worrying about. And now you're being very objective and detached from it. And it's almost as if the worrying thoughts are flowing down out of your arm, out through your fingers and the pen and onto the paper. And when you've done that, and then you read it afterwards, what happens is you get this detachment from it. You get a, a distancing uh, and a objectifying of these things you're worrying about. And you're looking at it and think, why am I worried about that? And do I want to continue to be worried about that? If so, then God bless you, go ahead. But if not, hmm, maybe I'll choose something different. But putting it down on paper is a huge step to taking it out of yourself, externalizing it, and taking control over it. Now, the next step is um, 
that I, you know, in, in the book and uh, in my workshops and when I'm working with people, we go through a guided visualization. Now, one of the things with worry and anxiety is it shows up always in our body somewhere. Um, you know, for me, when I was, when I would be anxious about something, it would always show up as a tension across my shoulders, back of my shoulders, in my neck. Everybody has something different. Some people it's there, some people it's their jaw, some people have get headaches, some people have, you know, their stomach gets all tense, whatever it is, it's wherever it shows up. But what we do with this guided visualization is we start to imagine this tension that's inside your body as an actual object. So for me, I, I would envision this like this steel bar that went from one shoulder right across to the other and just rigid steel bar. But then using my imagination, I would take that steel bar and I would shrink it down instead of being this long. Now it's only this long in my imagination. And then I'd take it and I'd stretch it out. So instead of just going from shoulder to shoulder, it goes right outside and touches the walls in the room. Then I shrink it down again. And then, then I change its shape. And instead of a bar, it's more of a ball. And then I make it long and then I make it short and just sort of manipulating it with my mind. And then I think about what color is it? You know, well, mine was sort of dark and gray. And then I'd make it bright yellow or green or purple or something. And I'm manipulating this thing with my mind. And as you can imagine, what's going on here is I'm starting to take control of this thing that's inside me. Instead of it controlling me, I'm now the one in charge. And then I'm moving around my body. I'll take this ball of tension and put it down in my left foot. And then I'll bring it out into my right arm. And then I'll put it in my left earlobe. And you know, just starting to have fun with it, literally. And then the final thing I do is I bring it out on my arm and I put it, and now it's sitting in my hand like a baseball. And I just sort of toss it up and down a few times, bounce it on the floor set it down on the floor, kick it a little. <laughs> and then I find that I pick it back up. And again, all of this is with my imagination. And, I, and then I watch it, I turn it from a solid ball into sort of dust at first and then kind of a mist. And then I just take a big breath and I blow it away. And I watch it as it just disappears into the air. Now, having gone through that, and then I open my eyes back up again, and then what I do, and I tell people, I say, okay, now go back to that iron bar that was across your shoulders. Can you find it? And of course it's gone. You know, it just, because that tension has just disappeared. And I say, now try and think about, try and worry about uh, whatever it is you were worrying about. Now try and worry about hurricanes. I can't <laughs> because I took it away. And that's how we start to gain control of it. However, as we said, it's a habit, and every habit will try to come back because it's been around forever. It likes it here. I heard somebody say one time, a, a habit is like a really comfortable bed. It's really easy to get into and hard to get out of. Anyway, so, so I need to replace this mental habit with a different set of mental habits, and there are three of them, three big new mental habits that we want to replace our anxiety with. And the first one is gratitude. I want to develop a habit, uh, first on a daily basis and then on an hourly basis, of having this constant uh, feeling of gratitude for the amazing things that are in my life. So the first step is waking up in the morning. First new habit. Upon waking, before you even get out of bed, before you do anything, before you check your phone, especially before you check your phone, Think of five things that you're grateful for. And every day, five different things and make them really specific. You know, not just I'm really, you know, I'm grateful for my health, I'm grateful. That's too easy. Do, you know, grateful for, I'm really grateful for that sunbeam right there. The one, you know, see the one that's coming in through my window, that one there feels so good. I am grateful this pillow that I've been lying on for the last eight hours, it is so comfy. Uh, I am grateful because there's some fresh blueberries in the fridge waiting for me that I'm gonna have for breakfast. So that kind of really specific things. And we start getting into the habit and the practice of finding things to be grateful for. I mean, right now, you and I, I'm sitting here being grateful for 
uh, Steve Jobs <laughs> because he, you know, this I've got this MacBook Air that we're talking on. I've got this iPhone that's recording. And, you know, wow, that's amazing. I didn't do a thing, but there they are. That, you know, that's really, really cool. So things like that. Uh, on a regular basis throughout your day because the and here's the nub of it when your mind is filled with gratitude there is absolutely no room in it whatsoever for worry or anxiety it is impossible to simultaneously hold a thought a worried thought and a grateful thought at the same time you cannot do it so we start filling our mind with this these uh, thoughts of appreciation gratitude and the worry just had nowhere to reside. So that's the first mental habit that we want to replace it with. The second one is something that we call replace it with purpose. Now what that means is we start thinking about what is it that you are here to do? You know, you've got this wonderful podcast that you're when you've talked to me before about, you know, this is, a, this is a passion project for you, you know, you're so excited about sharing it. Um, it's like your soul is in, uh, compelling you to do this. It's not, oh, oh, great, you know, somebody decided they'd pay me to do it, so I'll do it. It's, it, you love doing it. And every single person on the face of the planet has some type of purpose for themselves. Um, I, another great saying is, is uh, the two most important days of your life. The first one is the day you're born. And the second one is the day you figure out why. And uh, for me, it took, took a long time. You know, I was probably, I was in my late fifties before I figured out why. And then, but suddenly I thought, whoa, let's get going. I finally realized what I want to be when I grow up. And now I'm getting on with it. And like I'm launching, you know, I'm 66 and I'm launching my next 40 year career. And I'm so excited about that. And, uh, you know, there, we, we can look around. I mentioned Steve Jobs a minute ago. Uh, you know, we can look around and see those people who had an obvious mission and obvious purpose in life. And it was earth shattering the Steve Jobs, the Bill Gates, the Nelson Mandela's, but the, the Greta Thunbergs of the world today who are doing things that are amazing and changing the world as a result. Not everybody's going to have that. Some people say my passion, my purpose, my joy is in gardening. I just love getting my fingers in the dirt and watching those flowers come up or those vegetables and oh that just you, you know when you're in the zone that you found it. That's, mm -hmm. that's how you can tell. And everybody's got one. And when you find it and your mind is filled with that, then you've got a, this reason to get up in the morning, this reason to get the, to put in the effort. And again, there's no room for worry or anxiety at all.
that's beautiful. Um, so as you shared a little bit before, you know, it's almost seems like it's a contagious um, feeling to, to have, you know, around you, your environment, whether that's coming from the news, the couple mm -hmm. sitting in front of you, watching, you know, watching them observe their child and you may be feeling uh, their energy of, of worry. Um, how or what's a, maybe the best advice you can give to someone in, in environments like that? Yeah, all, all of the, all emotions, positive and negative, are contagious. Uh, when we hang around the people, the people we hang around, we start picking up on their emotions. And if they're feeling bummed out and down, then we're going to start feeling that way. If they're feeling joyous and up, then we're going to start feeling that way. So one of the things that I really recommend is uh, resign your membership in the complaining club. <laughs> we've, you know, we, we know these people. We, you know, they're the ones where you, um, you know, they walk in the room and you say, hey, what a beautiful day. And then it's, yeah, but it's probably going to rain tomorrow. <laughs> and you know, that just everything is a downer and everything is you know, a, a problem. And uh, then they tell you about how they've been sick and they tell you about this mole on their arm. That, and I just take those people out of my life. I don't have room in my life for that kind of toxicity. And uh, now you say, well, but it's my family. Yeah, uh, <laughs> there's, um, there's a great motivational speaker woman named Mel Robbins. And she's got this great quote, she says, uh, uh, toxic people are still toxic even when they're dis disguised as family, and so we want to make sure that we, if you know, if you have no choice because family is a little tougher, but minimize your contact, minimize your contact with those people, and maximize your contact with the people that are like-minded, that are lift you up, that bring the joy to the room, that bring the energy, that bring the optimism and the positivity to you. Uh, because then you can feed off that, but stay as far away and really limit your exposure to, um, you know, to news, to social negative social media, to uh, even entertainment. You know, I, I, I love watching movies. I'm a big movie fan, but don't try and show me something that's going to make me feel depressed or, you know, or worried or even scared. I, I am a sucker for anything that Pixar wants to put out all day long, and I'll ball my eyes out. You know, give me Toy Story, give me, uh, you know, Secret Life of Pets. Uh, you know, I love that stuff. Why? Because it makes me feel good, and I want to feel good, and I practiced feeling good that way. Um, and so I, I, you know, it, we we're all very concerned. You know, we fortunately as a society we've learned about eating habits. You know, we've learned healthy food is really, really important, yet don't want to take junk in. And so we're all saying, no, I'm all non-GMO products, all organic products and stuff. So we're very careful about what we take into our mouth. I want to be just as not more careful about what I take into my head, because that's even more toxic uh, than the stuff I put into my body. So yeah, stay away from those people because it is contagious and it, it will infect you and you'll feel down. I mean, it's funny, I have not watched news for probably eight or 10 months. And uh, I didn't miss it. I didn't miss it at all. With the election, I was curious. I'm, I've been curious. So I thought, oh, I'll just turn it on a little bit. And the difference in my mood and my feeling was palpable. I mean, within 24 hours, I could feel myself going down and getting, getting worked up and getting angry. And, and it doesn't, I don't care which side you're on. You know, there's just a lot of emotion in, involved in there. I don't need it. I don't want it in my life. I don't need it. I, you know, I work too hard to feel good. And when I feel good, I have the energy to do the things that I want to do and pursue the goals that I want to pursue. When you discover, okay, I'm realizing that I've got this anxiety or this worry or this fear about such and such. And one of the things that I did is I, uh, I, I went back and I study where did this start? I know I wasn't born with it. So it started somewhere. And I talked earlier about uh, you know, my own limiting beliefs about finances and money. 
Uh, I grew up in this family that, again, we weren't technically poor, but there were a lot of kids and not much income. And my mother, God bless her, was incredibly talented. She, so we lived in Canada and it was cold and stuff, but she would sew all our clothes. We were five kids and she would sew all our clothes. Um, amazing amount of work, incredible talent to do that. But when I was nine years old, all I knew was how embarrassed I was because all the other kids were wearing fancy store-bought clothes and I had homemade stuff. And that made me feel uh, self-conscious. It made me feel poor. It made me, you know, and now these were choices that I was making. I wasn't aware at nine years old that I was making those mental choices, but those were, that was how I was interpreting this situation. And so now, uh, you know, if I, as this lasts through my life, I think I want to get rid of that. I, that's not something that's useful to me. So I want to go back and find out where did that start? And I can, and I can easily find it. And that's where my journaling and writing out about these things plays in. And I can write about it and say, yeah, that makes sense that, that you would have this thing, but you don't have to hang on to it. I don't need to carry that with me. It's kind of like, uh, you know, if you, when you ride in a boat, uh, when you look back behind the boat, it leaves this wake in the back of the boat. And you can say, I know where the boat has been. It's really easy. There's this line in the water, but that has nothing whatsoever to do where the boat is going to in the future. And our, my past does not dictate my future and determine what I'm going to feel or experience or anything else as I go forward. Because I've had this experience in the past does not mean that I have to continue living it in the future. But it's really important to identify where it came from. What's the origins of that? And, you know, it can be things like, you know, I, I'm, you know, I did a silly one earlier about, oh, I'm too shy to stand up and sing karaoke. Well, maybe you've got a gorgeous voice, but maybe in the fifth grade, the music teacher, who was a jerk, said, nah, why don't you just hum along, you know, and let everybody else do the words? Well, boom, guess what? Uh, now from there on, I'm afraid to sing. But when I go back to that and find out, oh, yeah, that's where that started. But in that case, this teacher was, forget her, I don't need that anymore. I love to sing. So belt it out, you know, start in the shower and then go to karaoke and then join a choir. And before you know it, your career's made. Um, so that's how we want to go back because you're right. We we didn't we weren't born with it. We picked it up somewhere along the way. Let's figure out where we picked it up, and then go back and address it and say, okay, I figured out where it came from. Now I can leave it alone. One uh, quote that really resonates with me is "Control your mind, or it will control you." Of course, and through yes. more or less my spiritual awakening um, through meditation and, and whatnot, you begin to, I guess, acquire more understanding of how the mind works. Yes. Um, and of course, the work that you're doing and sharing and talking about, um, you know, it doesn't sound like such a spiritual thing, like, oh, attitude of gratitude. It's like a more, uh, if you will, like a, a formula for like a mathematic mm -hmm. formula to solve a problem, right? You know, X plus Y is causing you this. So mm -hmm. let's change x and y and create a new yeah. narrative or solution there, there is no line that separates the uh pragmatic and the mental and the spiritual there's no line in between them they're all connected and as i uh because i i meditate 30 minutes every day and uh that has taught me a tremendous amount about how my mind works it taught me a tremendous amount of what goes on inside there. It's also taught me a tremendous amount about how I control my mind. And all those skills, those skills are enormously useful. I mean, I picked up skills in meditation that help me when I'm uh, writing a test or doing some work because now I, I know how to focus better because of the work that I've, you know, the spiritual work that I've done. I, it applies uh, to my everyday life. I, and again, I make, I, I can't see the difference. I don't know that there's a dividing line in between those two things. Um, so I, I'm, I'm going to do that, that kind of work for myself. Uh, I spent, I've now spent years and years studying how my mind actually works. And one of the things that we 
uh, as humans uh, tolerate way too much is our mind that is just going wherever it wants. Think about your mind. It is a, a wonderful resource that we have been given. Uh, we were born with it. We get to use it. And yet we uh, look at it and think, well, I can't help what I think. The thoughts just come in. Imagine if your hand, now a hand is a really useful tool as well. I can reach over here, I can grab a pencil and I can put it back. But what if I said to my hand, okay, go over and pick up that pencil. And it says, no, no, I don't. I want to punch you in the face instead. And I had no control over it. You know, it would, what use would that be? And so we don't tolerate it with our hand, but why do we tolerate it with our head? Um, we're far too tolerant of just these wandering, uncontrolled thoughts. And we want to train our minds to do what we want it to do, to serve us. That's what it's there for. And yet we just allow it to be this unruly child and we make excuses for, well, it's just the way it is. I can't help it. Yes, actually, you can help it. <laughs> it takes training. It takes practice. Like, like any skill, any skill that you set out to do uh, takes some practice. At first, it will feel very uncomfortable and first it will be difficult, but then it gets easier and easier and easier. Uh, we just haven't decided to tackle our minds like that. But to get back to your point about, you know, spiritual versus day-to-day uh, -day kinds of things, again, I, there is no line in between those things. The, the one world just moves and is, you know, simultaneously occupies the other world. There is nothing that I do uh, in any given day that isn't both pragmatic and spiritual. It's they're just all <laughs> together. Well, I would love to maybe close off with you introducing your new book. I know that you're in the process of writing oh, yeah. that, right? Thank you. Oh, and yeah, I can even show you. This is the, you see it says here, uh, not for resale. This is the, sort of the, uh, but the, the new book, it's called, there it is, The Fearless Decision, How to Live in the World Without Being Afraid of It. And that comes out on November 17th. Um, the first book was Unsubscribed from Anxiety, but this one is, well, as it says, how to live in the world without being afraid of it. And that's, as we've been talking now, the, um, uh, it's a decision that I make. It's a decision that anybody can make. I'm tired of being worried all the time. I'm going to decide not to be worried anymore. It's not something that you have to wait for some other person, some other condition to change. You get to decide right now. Yeah, that's it. I've had it. I'm done. Uh, let's stop. So that's the new book. I'm excited about that. It just it's uh, actually went off to the printer today. So congratulations. That is super exciting, I'm sure. <laughs> um, so with your previous experience, you know, prior to kind of, I guess, applying your own practices after it sounds like your your peaking point was age of fifty five. Is that what you're sharing? Oh yeah, yeah, that was that that, well, that was a good one. <laughs> that was the year of uh, well, it wasn't a year, but that was a month, August of uh, two thousand nine. Spent that living in my car, being homeless, and that was you know in retrospect, it was one of the best things that ever happened to me, because finally I had to say, all right, this has got to stop, and. Uh, you know, the, the, the universe or God or whatever it is, you know, gives you little hints and nudges along the way and says, hey, you should pay attention to this. And, and we ignore it. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. You know, or pretend we don't hear. And eventually they just say, that's it. You've had enough. Bam! You, know, here, you can't ignore this. And whether it's a heart attack or a divorce or whether it be it for homelessness, uh, you say, oh, OK, I'm paying attention now. And I realized, you know, all, whatever I'd been doing was not working and I needed to change that. So that's when I said, all right, my ideas, let's just put them aside. We all get so enamored of our own thinking. And uh, I worried myself into homelessness. That's really what it was. You know, we, uh, my greatest fear growing up and throughout my entire adult life is that I would you know, become broke and I couldn't afford and I'd be homeless. Well, guess what? <laughs> it came true. Now, the cool thing was it came true and I thought, oh, wow, 
I didn't die. I, you know, I lived to tell about it and I lived to learn from it as well. And now my life has been fantastic ever since, uh, but it took a different course. So I, all those things that we're so afraid of that we all think, oh, you know, that's the worst thing that could possibly happen. Um, no, it's not. Uh, the likelihood of it happening, whatever it is for you is very, very small, but even if it does, you'll survive it. You really have, you really will. Yeah, as like I said a few minutes ago, you know, every single challenge that has come along in your life so far, you've survived and you lived to tell about it and you overcame it. That's a pretty good track record. Yeah, that's amazing. Cause I'm sure as um, uh, that nine year old maybe thinking, oh, these clothes don't fit right. I can never be a, a professional mm -hmm. author or a writer or anyone. <laughs> Uh, you know, a, even a, a speaker to stand in front of a crowd and share your message. Um, yeah. How did you shed that limiting belief then? What was really the... Well, it didn't happen because, uh, you know, for many years I was a speaker, uh, you know, standing on stages, you know, there'd be 500 people in the audience. But my head, in my head, you know, I'd be talking and delivering a, a speech but in the back of my head was going on, who the hell do you think you are to be able to stand up in front of all these people? You know, imposter syndrome, we all get it. But I didn't, I, and that was before I learned that I get to control the thoughts. And so when it all hit the fan and I said, okay, enough, you can stop this now. When I realized, no, you're every bit as worthy as anybody else. You're a smart guy, you have these capabilities. Just because you grew up thinking that doesn't mean it's true, doesn't mean it was true then, and it certainly doesn't mean it's true now. And so uh, that's when I made that, made that decision. And that's why the book is called The Fearless Decision. Where I said, I don't want to have this thought anymore. It does not serve me. I, I'm going to have a different thought instead. I'm going to, you know, we use the word, I'm going to change my mind. Well, I'm going to change my mind on purpose. I'm going to set out on purpose to have a different thought than I had before. And I won't allow that thought in my head anymore. And when it does come in, and that's, you know, level of awareness, I'd say, aha, there you are again. Sorry, I'm going to replace you. I'm going to be grateful for something. I'm going to take action. I'm going to uh, find what my purpose is, focus on that. And then there's no room for that thought anymore. That's how you do it. In a, in a perfect world, that would be quite, quite a, an amazing place to be in where everyone was, yeah, not worried, not afraid of the next person hurting them, stealing from them, doing something. Mm -hmm. Anybody can create it if they want. Awesome. And every day we have the choice. Yes, we do. Every morning, 24 hours fresh mm -hmm. to serve you, right? Or exactly. Or have it serve you, you serve it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I am beyond grateful to share this conversation with you today and look forward to reading your next book. Oh, well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you inviting me onto the show. And uh, I just love sharing this message. As you can tell, I get so excited about it. No, that's impressive um, because more or less you have found your, your passion on purpose or with purpose. Yeah. And those are the type of people that I want to have on this podcast to hopefully encourage mm -hmm. others to discover that for themselves as well. Um, so if you could just share where people can connect with you or how to find you on. on yes, that. best place, the easiest place would be our Facebook group. It's called the Fearless Living and Growth Society. Uh, it's grown fast and there's where we talk about and share these techniques and help people overcome. The website is www.i-fearless.com ifearless.com. Go there, they can get in touch with me. Please, I encourage anybody if they want to get in touch with me directly, my email, you know, david at i-fearless.com. Send me an email. I love, I get them all personally. I respond to them all and uh, I would love to have a chat with anybody. That's wonderful. Well, David, thank you again for fulfilling your mission towards helping others heal their anxiety that is just paralyzing to most so <laughs> my pleasure thanks for inviting me on Brittany <laughs>